Um, in particular, we're focusing on three things. One is data collection. How can we get the data uh, to the virtual world to um, uh, through interesting devices, interesting networking, uh, and, and other mechanisms. Um, and the other one is how we manage and extract information from the data we collected, this including how do we archive and store the data, how do we do uh, infrastructure to support data analysis, and so on and so forth. And the third one is more on how we can collaborate or enable people to collaborate with, uh, on these data, uh, getting the data together to uh, build on top of each other's system to help us understand these data and make use and visualize them. Uh, several particular application domains we're looking at are um, environmental monitoring. Um, I'm going to drill uh, down a lot more on this today. Uh, other things are um, uh, data center operation and energy efficiency. This is what uh, uh, is, is bread and butter for Microsoft as a cloud computing service provider. Uh, the cost and energy of running these data centers is quite significant. So uh, we have uh, many research projects in helping Microsoft and the data center industry as a whole to, uh, to be more energy efficient. And the third thread is along the lines of mobile computing. Uh, as we are carrying multiple sensors on the phones every day with us, we have the opportunity of understanding user activity and user behavior and preference through these uh, real-world uh, uh, sensor data. Um, so we want to leverage that to, to uh, provide better services for mobile users. Um, in terms of the environmental monitoring work, um, I'll give a couple of examples. This is a example that we collaborate with uh, Johns Hopkins University and the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, um, and they are de uh, deploying sensors in the rainforest, try to understand the climate changes um, uh, in that environment. So these are some of the sensors being deployed. There are 50 of these sensors. Um, they actually hang from these uh, very tall towers. <coughs> and to, to try to create a 3D uh, vision or uh, reconstruction of, of the climate environment in that piece of the rainforest as a pilot. And uh, the, the first generation of the sensors here are temperature, humidity, and uh, soil sensors, which the Hopkins uh, uh, group was championing over the years. Another example that's been done, I think, through uh, about a five, uh, five year span uh, in collaboration with EU and uh, ETH and a couple of uh, uh, universities in Europe that uh, the scientists are interested in understanding the climate changes in the, uh, in the Alps and they're putting different kinds of sensors uh, in, the, uh, in the wild, collecting data and, and we are providing an infrastructure that will allow them to share these data together to build on top of each other's data sources to create a visualization tool for them to uh, visualize what the data um, uh, shows and to guide them to the next generation of deployment where are gaps in the sensor data, uh, how can we uh, put better and, and, and different kind of sensors together. Some of the key technical challenges, as said, in, uh, in this work, especially from the system side, um, we're focusing on, uh, first of all, uh, sensor networking. Uh, this is our main uh, angle of attack in, in this work, um, especially towards since these sensors are going to be in the wild, uh, energy management is, is challenging. Uh, how do we improve the data yield? Many of the sensor networks suffer from the uh, device failure as well as the network failure. Um, essentially, we don't get the, the, the uh, necessary amount of data or as we wish, and deployment strategies. How do we um, uh, leverage people and motion and other uh, other objects in the physical world to help us deploy and, uh, and get, get sensor data at different points. Uh, another thread is along data management. Um, how do we represent data? How do we do uh, data archiving? And there's an interesting angle about this is also how do we task specific sensors once we have demands on the, on, on the, uh, uh, from the data point of view. If, uh, since collecting all the data at all time is energy consuming and 
and a lot of times un unrealistic. Um, how, how can the system to understand what uh, what essentially is needed from the application demand point of view and selectively task different sensors based on where they are, based on their, their data yield, based on uh, their data quality in the past. Uh, data visualization uh, is another interesting uh, aspect. We're collaborating with the uh, uh, Worldwide Telescope team, uh, Jens here, um, on, on trying to get some of these geospatial uh, data on top of, uh, of a very nice visualization platform. I'll drill down to some specific um, um, research uh, themes. One of them is this uh, uh, participatory environmental monitoring toolkit that we're building. In particular, we're leveraging uh, some new technologies we've developed uh, over the past year or two, try to shrink the size of these sensors to make them very portable. Um, the goal is to actually shrink these uh, entry sensors to the size of either a watch or a keychain that you can put on a uh, backpack uh, or wear it to, uh, every day. And they can collect things like uh, uh, radiation, things like CO2, and uh, 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 temperature humidity and all those uh, data as you move along in your city, in your daily life. So to give you, uh, give scientists a way of, of, uh, of a sparse yet a representative set of data that's actually carried um, by the people who uh, uh, through their daily life. One of the, uh, the couple of interesting technologies that goes into this, one is a very low energy GPS location sensing technology that, um, so today most of the GPS people, when people think about them as a black box. It's a chip that gives you a lab long. And that's very energy consuming. So your GPS sensor on your phone is a, uh, half a watt device. So when you use it, it lasts for 30 seconds to get you the location. It consumes half a watt during that 30 seconds. It's very hard to use those kind of technologies in an embedded sensor that we're imagining being solar powered and we want a frequent data sampling throughout the day. Instead, what we're doing is to have a 10 milliwatt chip and we only run it for two milliseconds to get enough data and then we can later send the data to the cloud to, to reconstruct and recompute the location um, in the infrastructure. So instead of getting the location right here, right now, we're going to just log the raw data and do the processing in the cloud. So that way we can make the device a lot more cheaper in terms of getting the geolocation data through GPS units. Uh, the other interesting uh, feature of this device is the auto jack interface we put in as pretty much a universal uh, interface that they can put on any phones, but these are, could be smartphones, could be feature phones, and so on, um, to communicate and upload the data. This is not really, um, really a, not really a technology advance. It's more like a backward uh, looking technology that I think about modems, right? These are the way computers <coughs> used to communicate. But with that, we can get a, a very universal um, uh, communication channel between these devices. Uh, between these sensors and, uh, uh, and devices. So this is particular, we're designing them here towards developing countries where people may carry just a phone or even a feature phone, but they have interesting path, interesting daily life, they want to collect data uh, uh, through their uh, uh, daily path. And from there, the data is sent to the cloud and they're managed over there and uh, through, uh, or to combined together with other data uh, to support interesting uh, decisions and data analysis. Uh, another project is the SenseWeb project. This is where we first start to look into the, the, the concept of uh, Wikipedia of sensors. That we want to provide an open interface that, that anyone who has interesting sensors, this, this could be the uh, weather station in your backyard, could be a webcam that points to a section of the street, could be the uh, participatory sensors we have, uh, or we're designing, and to, to be able to upload the data, to annotate them, to geotag them, and the system manages those data uh, uh, streams to, um, to be able to do transformation of the, these data, to combine them, aggregate them, and also be able to test them to say, I, I really want this piece of data right here, right now, uh, to answer one of the queries my uh, say the scientist is interested in asking, and, uh, and uh, directly test those data in the real world. Um, 
Cypress is a project that we're specifically looking into the data management challenges. Um, in, in one of the motivation of this work is, in, in fact, in our data center monitoring system, that we're collecting a terabyte a day of data. Uh, with that amount, traditional SQL-based data management tool is not, not uh, it's just simply not scaled uh, to the amount of data we, we like. So uh, we, we designed several um, techno techniques in order to manage that data in an interesting way. One is instead of the typical SQL-based horizontal way of storing the data, we store them per stream or per, per data types. So we can use uh, data type specific compression algorithm um, that, that applies to the specific census streams. The other one is what we call trickles. This is really to break the stream into smaller streams through spectrum analysis so we can compress each of these trickles uh, separately. And um, in particular, we're using some interesting technology that's called the sketch in the database world. It's called compressive sensing in the, uh, in the, in the signal processing world that we compress this data um, to a smaller set, yet preserve a key property, which is correlation properties among data streams. So one of the benefit is in order to do uh, data analysis, uh, such as correlation which, uh, and histogram, we don't have to reconstruct the raw data out of the compressed streams, yet we can apply these um, uh, data analysis algorithms directly on these already compressed data sets. So uh, it makes the process <laughs> a lot more faster. Uh, the third approach is to look at the correlations among these data streams. For example, I showed a picture of um, uh, 10 data streams. These are temperature sensor data uh, from correlated or nearby sensors. And we can see that they, are, they have a trend that's quite similar, but yet there's some differences uh, among them. So instead of compressing or storing them individually, we're going to say, OK, we're going to find out how correlated or how similar they are and just store one data, and the rest we're going, we're going to store the, uh, either the ratio or the differences from that sample template uh, we have. So by combining all these techniques, we got uh, 100 times compression out of uh, typical sensor data streams. So for that terabyte of day uh, data source we get, um, we, we, we boil it down or compress it into about 10 gigabyte a day, which now we're talking about a server of a terabyte can store a year, multiple years of data instead of, instead of spreading it uh, into multiple servers. Um, data sharing is, is a critical issue among science, uh, scientific discoveries. And um, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in Yen's team, they've been studying how scientists are using tools and um, uh, what they want through these uh, IT technologies. One of the things people really wanted is a, a, a uh, open format of exchanging uh, data. And Microsoft has uh, this old data technology, which, uh, which is an um, uh, open data representative uh, among different types of data. And it's already built in many of these uh, Office and SQL and uh, web server tools that's ready for, uh, for uh, uh, scientists to adopt. On the visualization side, I think one of the very exciting development is the uh, worldwide telescope, and um, and all the geo data visualization capabilities it brings um, on board. Um, it can it can scroll through time, through uh, space, and um, uh, coordinate and combine multiple data sources uh, at the same time. Uh, one of the the work that um, that Yen has been championing was to uh, uh, can use that to take data, in this case, through uh, Excel spreadsheet, process them using old data to, to, uh, uh, to share and convert them to a common representation, and then they can port it directly into a worldwide telescope and then visualize the data in 3D on the, on, uh, on the screen. And I think Yen, Yen's here, and she'll be very happy to show a demo of this. We don't have enough time in this talk to show that. Uh, the, U the UI is very smooth, it's very natural to use. So as a conclusion, I think um, we are really working towards building um, a Wikipedia of, of environmental sensing. Uh, this includes the open platform, and anyone can, can register, their sensors can submit data to, and open data format that these data 
hopefully will be uh, understood across uh, different subsystems. It's uh, participatory. Um, uh, we're, in, we're designing the sensors and the networking technologies to make that possible. Uh, the data will be discoverable in the system, will be searchable, and they're interoper uh, interoperable. Uh, one of the key features are how to visualize and analyze this data such that different organizations, different people can build these, uh, build their, their research and build their data on top of each other. So, um, yeah, at the end I want to sort of take a minute to advertise two events that's coming related to uh, maybe audience in this, in this room. One is census. This is uh, very much on the computer system side of uh, sensor networking. And um, uh, it's happening in November uh, 1st to 4th, uh, essentially in a month from now, um, in Seattle. And I'm organizing this event. The early, early registration deadline is tomorrow, so if you're interested in going, um, you're very welcome. Uh, the other one is the environmental uh, informatics uh, event um, that Yen's been organizing since 2010. Uh, one of the, uh, this is one of the early event uh, pictures um, uh, in Redmond, I believe, in 2010. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be uh, there again in 2012. And uh, it's, it's an event dedicated to people who are interested in um, uh, data discovery, accessibility, and, and, and consumability um, in the uh, environmental context. So uh, with that, thank you very much. <coughs> Have time for questions? You've, uh, you've mostly talked about ab ab abiotic um, sensors, so like the physical world. Uh, have you given much thought to uh, actually uh, being able to uh, monitor biodiversity, like living elements, or have you thought of? Uh, yes, um, a little bit. I, I, I'm not um, a biologist. Uh, my my knowledge is at best second-handed. Um, I did participate in some of the discussions in Brazil uh, through that uh, uh, rainforest deployment. And, uh, quite a few discussions was about uh, uh, the monitoring of, of the bioenvironment. Um, one of the goal of the sensor design we have was to fulfill that uh, goal from just a site. Uh, there was, I don't know whether, uh, there was a project in Princeton a couple of years ago called Zebranet. They used quite heavy sensor, one kilogram size uh, sensor as, uh, put as a color, put on the zebra and track their activities, uh, how they move around, how they interact with, with each other, and, and so on. Um, we essentially can do the same thing with uh, maybe uh, 10 gram or 20 gram sensors, meaning that it's much more friendly uh, uh, to the to the animals, and uh, they're less likely to get uh, ripped off by the animals, and so on. So that's one angle where we were attaching the pro attacking the problem to get a better sensor. Um, the uh, other work I I've, I've heard and know of are uh, using uh, cameras and um, uh, other devices to uh, to monitor our region. Uh, their work in. I believe uh, Portland State University, they're, they're trying to track a particular kind of frog in Australia by using sound as the trigger, and then we'll take a picture to identify the frog and uh, their locations. Uh, that's another uh, sort of sensor network side of the work I know of. Uh, but I, I, I think that's the purpose I'm here. I'd like to hear more of this kind of input on, on what sensors are, are needed for projects or ideas like that and what are the technology limitations you guys are seeing that we need to uh, leap over to achieve some of the goals uh, people are, are uh, want to achieve. Okay, well, I'd like to talk to you. Um, I'm curious about, uh, I, I guess, combining different data streams with different levels of data fidelity. So for instance, having a handheld sensor that is reading uh, sulfur dioxide or hydrogen disulfide or carbon monoxide um, as, a, as a sensor feed with something like a Twitter feed <coughs> where someone might be complaining of breathing difficulties or asthma concerns, that type of thing. 
is there a is there a sense making mechanism where you can combine two different types of data to provide additional information to people who might have some sort of health concern with uh, increased levels of uh, environmental pollutants, that type of thing? So um, we are working with uh, the machine learning groups in MSR uh, to try to combine different, different data types, data streams uh, for, well in that particular case was for advertisement purpose, which is a very <laughs> different context. But think about uh, Twitter fees together with your location, with your personal habit. That's why the mobile computing thread uh, we have. But the, the backend tool uh, was quite generic. It's, it's, it's called MART. Uh, um, it's, it's a multi-dimensional uh, adaptive aggregation tree. And uh, that's essentially what, what is used in the ranking algorithm in Bing to mm -hmm. provide a, a web search uh, ranking. Mm -hmm. And, and we're using essentially the same tool, but adapt to physical sensor data, location proximities, and uh, time, and so on. So I would hope techniques like that will apply to this context, but we don't have direct experience yet. Okay. Thank you. I was wondering what problems you've run into with accessibility and how you've surmounted those. There are a lot of people interested in environmental data, and it's not always easy to get access to. I don't know if you've uh, that's a tough question. Yeah. Um, the organization barriers is, uh, is difficult, right? Uh, privacy is very challenging. Uh, a lot of these cases, we're actually tapping into a particular group of people, and they sign certain agreement and say, I don't want my data to be right, shared outside the organization, and so on. Uh, we've done some work in terms of adding noise to the data so they can be used in an aggregated way. There's a notion of differential privacy, um, yet not revealing any individual data traces. That I see maybe one step towards getting it smoother in terms of across the organization boundaries. So I can, I will build an interface that you can do query, but either um, I'm, I don't allow you to query as much, uh, there's a bound of how many queries you can send in. And two, when you send in a query, I'm going to control my data to process them in a way that you can do aggregation analysis. Say you can estimate the average traffic, but I'm not going to give you individual person's trace. Uh, that can be done. Uh, in a very systematic, sort of formal way. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. So, quick question. So, uh, just interest, I'm interested in, uh, in your opinion, what's the trend in mobile sensing? The applications and the trend? It's exploding, and that's for sure. Uh, the driving force is ad advertisement, it's not any scientific right, usage. This is about tracking user activity, their behavior, their path what kind of store you visit and to give you a targeted advertisement. But uh, that uh, really motivated people to look at different kinds of sensors on the phone, uh, what they can do and derive uh, this information from it. And uh, it's, it's astonishing how, how much information you can derive from these sensors. Right? I, I can know whether you're, you're sitting here, uh, I can know whether you're in a conference, I can know who's talking, I can know right, a lot of information just using sensors that's already there. Uh, privacy is a big issue. Um, that's yet to be yet to be resolved. Um, but that's not preventing people trying it, right? There are a lot of work in terms of uh, just trying to derive the user context. Uh, so some of the same technologies will be and can be applied here. Um, things like uh, indoor location tracking and all of a lot of those things, if we combine them with interesting sensors that the environmental scientists are interested in, we can get a lot more uh, uh, data, interesting data coming out of that. The other interesting thing is in mobile devices, it's, it's also a user input device. So you can quickly get user uh, feedback and input into the system. So you can essentially get tag data or annotated, annotated data uh, at the spot when users collecting these data, which can be very useful. I think we'll move on. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, uh, the head being the Hydroecological Engineering Advanced Decision Support Group at, uh, at the Berkeley Labs. Yeah, thanks very much. So I'm going to be addressing maybe a little bit more of the sociology of uh, data sharing in my presentation. Um, and uh, looking at the last 12 years, the evolution of a system that is sort of homegrown amongst stakeholders, 
attempting to meet uh, salinity uh, regulation in the San Joaquin Basin. Um, I need to probably give you a little bit of background in order for the presentation to make sense. Um, this is the Central Valley of California. Uh, this is the Delta. Uh, it's an agriculturally dominated uh, basin. A lot of irrigated agriculture. We're going to be focusing on the San Joaquin Basin, which is basically <clears throat> the top third of the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and the important thing to, to know is that the east side of the valley gets its irrigation water from the Sierra. It's good quality water. The west side of the valley gets its water from the delta. It's pumped from the delta. It contains salt. And basically the saline return flows from the west meet the high quality return flows from the east in the San Joaquin. The delta is the water supply, as I said, for west side uh, irrigation. It's also the water supply for Los Angeles. So water quality and salinity, per se, is a big concern. In California, uh, especially in the San Joaquin Basin, it's a water short basin. There's a lot of competition for water. So we've got urban, uh, basically municipalities competing with uh, wetlands. We've got uh, about 200,000 acres of wetlands in the San Joaquin Basin. These are managed wetlands, not natural wetlands. And we have agriculture. And the way through lots of lawsuits these guys resolved some of the issues is to set a water quality standard or objective for salinity at a place called Vinales. And this is a 700 EC uh, salinity objective for the irrigation season when crops are most sensitive to salt and a 1000 EC objective for the non-irrigation uh, season. So basically this whole basin is constrained uh, for salinity. And as you can imagine that creates potential for conflict. <coughs> The, um, the way this was resolved was somewhat unique. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard, those of you involved with environmental regulation, about TMDLs, Total Maximum Daily Loads. This is typically the way the, U the US EPA regulates contaminants, salinity being a contaminant. So they set the maximum loads that a watershed can export, either on a monthly basis or a daily basis. The regional board, which is basically the policeman of water quality in, in the state of California and in the uh, Central Valley, decided to take a slightly different approach. And that was uh, developed a stakeholder-driven, um, uh, uh, stakeholder-centric approach to salinity uh, planning regula regulation called real-time salinity management. And that is basically trying to control the salt export, not by fiat in a TMDL, but rather by essentially sharing information related to salinity so that folks could manage their own salt. Um, and it requires these discharges, especially the west side discharges that are exporting most of the salt, but there is salt that comes from the east side, uh, to adopt a board approved real time salinity management program and the monitoring, real time data access, modeling, and decision support basically all needed to come together. Now we started this about 12 years ago. And those of you who can remember back that long uh, will know that our sensor, sensor networks would even been talked about. HTML was just sort of uh, uh, you know, starting out. The first uh, environmental websites were being put together. So um, I'm going to take you through uh, the ev evolution <coughs> and compare uh, you know, three different uh, methods that we adopted uh, along the way. Um, the compliance isn't until 2014. This is when the rubber hits the road. <coughs> uh, the approach we took was, even though we have to evolve this basin widening, the basin is a large basin. It's <coughs> well over a million acres. So it's a very, very large scale application, and there's a lot of money that's going to need to be put into this. We, we decided, as, as our exemplar, to start small, uh, more sort of stakeholder-led, and focus on a wetland community where, which had all the elements of the larger basin. It, it essentially has state refuges, it has federal refuges, 
um, the federal in blue, the state in green, and then it has 160 different duck clubs, which is essentially 160 different decision makers, all in this mix. So we have to develop a system of data sharing with individuals and, and agencies that are not used to sharing information and have never shared information and, and you know, quite frankly would rather not share information except for this, uh, this regulation. And just to put this, this wetland area in context, this is the Samaritan Basin that I've already shown you, uh, dominated by the Samaritan River. Um, this is the, is the Samaritan <coughs> right, uh, right, right here. Um, and the area of wetlands is located just, uh, just there. <coughs> just a couple of definitions are important. Uh, one being a similar capacity, uh, which is essentially the mass of a pollutant, in this case salinity, that can be safely discharged to a receiving water, in this case the Samaritan River, without exceeding the water quality objective of that pollutant. And then uh, this, this term, real-time water quality management, which uh, I, I coined for, for this, um, uh, that you know, it was eventually adopted by the, by the regional board in the legislation, which is a coordinated and cooperative set of actions based on real-time forecasts of, of water quality, meaning data, to consistently meet water quality objectives. And just in a nutshell, uh, this is essentially a, a time series plot of a similar, of a similar capacity in the San Joaquin, this area above the line, where you see these dips below the line, it means we're sending more salt down the river than it can safely accommodate, which means a violation of the objective. And what we're talking in real-time water quality management is moving these areas that are below the line uh, to above the line, meaning a shift in timing. So we're changing the timing of the salt loads essentially to remain in compliance. So basically the three uh, systems I'm going to be comparing uh, are where we started with, uh, with Campbell uh, Scientific uh, LogiNet software and uh, at the time uh, an, an innovation which was a real-time data management uh, software that worked with uh, these, this, this kind of, uh, hardware that we were using in the field. Uh, the next innovation was back about 2005, uh, a company called YSI developed YSI Econet, which is really the first web application using their sensors. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, data sharing, but also data integrity, and the fact that we need to QA a lot of this data before we put it out. And then thirdly, uh, basically where we are today, um, uh, we're using some of the uh, Kister's uh, Whiskey uh, software. So this is where we started out. Um, the, the first application, this was the northern part of, the, of Grassland Water District, which is the private uh, wetlands that I showed you a picture of uh, before we divided that area into five different um, uh, component areas that basically drained through um, specific sites. So we're looking at water coming into this area and as, as well as water going out. And uh, we deployed um, a bank of sensors basically to measure flow, um, which meant uh, stage sensors, velocity sensors combined to measure flow. And in this environment, measuring flow is extremely difficult. It's one of the most difficult things to me measure accurately. Water quality sensors are, are, are pretty easy to deploy, but getting good flow information, which you need to compute loads, is very difficult. And this, this is our first attempt, um, basically creating a picture of each one of the sites and creating a, a, essentially a JPEG image of the, of the data, um, essentially posting that uh, every, every day. And the data management uh, system here was uh, Microsoft Excel. Well, for those of you who've attempted to do some, some of this with, with Excel, you realize there are two things. One is your files get really huge, really quickly, and then because we essentially have a JPEG you know, for every day uh, of the year for each sensor, again, uh, data storage and data manipulation is, is, is very difficult. And there weren't commercial tools available to us to do that sort of management. So the advantages of the system, uh, the Campbell hardware was extremely adaptable and could be easily customized to the application. It wasn't particularly easy to program the sensors back then. That's become somewhat easier. Uh, they are robust and pretty easy to troubleshoot. Um, 
The disadvantages was it was very difficult to integrate the cellular goes and landline telemetry. We had all, all three uh, essentially uh, coming in. We need specialized software to get our go signal. And uh, I mean, this created uh, somewhat of a, a, a data management uh, uh, nightmare, especially because some of the people that we were asking to do this were wetland biologists. We became wetland biologists not to sit behind a computer, but to go out in the field and run around with the uh, bugs and bunnies out there and, and, and basically you know, sense the environment with their two eyes. So um, we had a, a very reluctant group of people who really didn't want to do the data management, but, you know, but essentially had to on this, on this project. And we learned a lot from, from that. I mean, you need willing participants. Um, so it was time uh, consuming to operate and troubleshoot, um, even with uh, the automation that was offered in Loganet. Essentially we had a series of batch files, but if one process in that batch operation failed, uh, basically the process would stop. So there was a lot more, even though we were automated, there was a lot more time involved in uh, essentially troubleshooting some of that automation when it didn't work. Um, and. Uh, and then was, there was a lag in the data processing. I mean, if you want real-time data access, you need to process this stuff right away. Um, and you need to sort of get it out there. And if it's a week late, it's not going to do people or decision makers a whole lot of good. And also, you know, we had these unsightly uh, monitoring stations. Um, one of my colleagues uh, you know, calls them outdoor WCs, you know. And, but, you know, if you look, USGS, I mean, this is a standard fare for USGS, they still put these stations out there. The wetland biologists didn't like them, they were sort of unsightly, it, it sort of destroyed, in terms of their own aesthetic, in terms of how monitoring ought to be done, it just sort of violated everything that, that they sort of believed in. So, um, so we needed a different, uh, a different sort of approach. Um, there was a... Um, I mean, part of the part of the work um, uh, also that was on, ongoing was to, you know, I mentioned we were focusing on the wetlands, but we also had to make some progress on the larger system, um, and we installed uh, water quality monitoring at a number of river stations, because remember, even though we're focusing on salt discharge from these wetlands, we need to look at a similar capacity in, in the river itself, and so we needed to advance uh, advance that. And we uh, developed some uh, forecasting uh, capability. Um, basically, every week, um, well, actually, ended up every day, but basically putting out our, our estimate of what we thought the sort of capacity was of, of the river and broadcast to our uh, sort of participants, you know, what the, um, I mean, we couldn't make the sharing uh, decisions for them, but we basically said, this is how much salt is available. And, uh, you know, down the road, these folks would uh, try to figure out how to make use of that. The, uh, so the second, and I'm going to need to move a little faster here, uh, the second um, system was Vaisai Econet, and this sort of topology is probably familiar to a lot of you, essentially field hardware, um, sensors, uh, data nodes reporting to access nodes, the access nodes, uh, either CDMA telemetry or uh, sort of radio telemetry uh, to, a, um, to a ring system uh, attached to um, a NIVIS uh, data center which collects uh, information from, uh, you know, from all the stations. The, uh, in terms of our hardware, it now goes from a pillbox, essentially something looks like this, it's a lot more acceptable. The advantages was it was extremely simple to install and become operational. The ability to restrict access on the public site, uh, website to QA sensor data, meaning that we were only sharing uh, the, the uh, sensor data um, or the data that we had gone through and, and take, taken a look at. You know, the problem was you know, essentially how to do that. The website was completely customizable for the display of sensor parameters. A graphic uh, visualization formats and allowed us uh, essentially back uh, GIS backdrops so uh, the, the biologists could, could find themselves essentially um, in, the, uh, in the watershed. Uh, and then rapid, rapid tech transfer amongst the wetland community created a new paradigm. 
I mean, these guys in the space of two years uh, started to become a lot more quantitative in, in terms of the way they were managing their information. The disadvantages is that we, the YSI set this up that we couldn't directly uh, access the information uh, from, the, from the nodes. And there was a lack of integration with QA software. They hadn't really thought out the, the data quality assurance uh, uh, aspect. And uh, eventually we came up with a solution, but we essentially had to uh, create uh, new tables within Nivis and then essentially hand FTP these, uh, or manually FTP this information uh, to the Nivis Center. And there was an inability to mix and match with other uh, data logging hardware. And this is basically what uh, some of the sites look like. You see we can bring in GIS images and uh, locate the sensors in an environment these, these guys are quite familiar with. And again, a couple of more uh, pictures of the, of the sensors that we have deployed and some of the maps just showing the, the entire network. Um, as I mentioned, uh, data quality assurance was not really uh, well thought out. Uh, we ended up uh, picking up um, QA software, object-oriented uh, um, software f f called Aquarius, uh, based on a, a MATLAB uh, platform, and that uh, worked really well for us. However, it wasn't well integrated with uh, with, with YSI uh, Econet, and it was still essentially time-consuming. Uh, these are just some of the, the features of that Aquarius uh, uh, software. This is what. Uh, the data looks like it. You never destroy your raw trace, but you can annotate essentially the manipulations that you make to the data. It's, it's very nice software. The, the lack of integration essentially was what uh, was stymied us. And then lastly, uh, uh, whiskey, this whiskey toolbox uh, that, we've, uh, that uh, uh, we that uh, we have uh, adopted. One of the probably the most important thing is that so there's an already an installed base amongst some of the water districts in California. So essentially by adopting this, this software for this, this purpose, we're doing something that, uh, or we're using software that's already in common use. And uh, in terms of data sharing, that's, that's a pretty important consideration. If you're using uh, software that your uh, stakeholders, some of the more advanced ones are already using, it's going to make uh, data sharing that much easier. Uh, these, these folks, this company also has a local presence in Northern California. It's a robust system, the company is worldwide, and they're used to handling you know, very large data sets. And it's also able to perform low-cost SCADA control functions. Um, I mean, SCADA, some people might think, well, why didn't you just convert to SCADA? It's one, very expensive, and two, we want our stakeholders to be able to understand these systems. And they don't understand uh, SCADA systems. I mean, there is a learning curve with the, with the software, um, which will uh, will need to provide some help uh, down the road. Just a couple of uh, uh, images of uh, some of what this uh, uh, the software does. And as I say, data QA is very important in California. Uh, it's one of the most important things, and one of the big reluctances to share data is that. Unless you're putting good quality data out there, people don't want to share it, um, and uh, and it's overlooked time and time again. You know, data is only really good if it's if it is good data. Otherwise, you can get into trouble. And in a litigious state like California, the lawyers will start uh, calling. You know, when uh, and and we had an instance where one of our stakeholders. I mean, some of the he called us and he said, you know, the, the data you're putting out is um, is wrong, and actually was a was a problem with uh, the, uh, the company that made the sensors, they had a decimal place wrong uh, in their output, and uh, he was getting total volumes that were just absurd. So, uh, uh, anyway, these again are some of the, some of the, uh, um, some of what's available under the, the QA part of the software. Um, Again, uh, setting uh, data validation rules uh, can be done, it can be automated. And uh, eventually we've got a little cloud here because uh, the company is very focused on standardization of interoperability protocols to enhance data sharing. Uh, they're involved with OGC, 
in, in, involved um, with a lot of um, international um, uh, organizations that are trying to advance um, uh, standardization of, of, of data sharing. And, and the, co the company has uh, tools uh, to help, uh, uh, or uh, tools and architecture to help uh, organize uh, the time series information and put it into a form that it can be shared. Uh, this is where we're headed in terms of uh, in terms of being able to put so this stuff on, on the web and, and fully automate and have uh, essentially a customer base that's uh, that's that's happening. Um, so uh, I'm, I know, know I have time. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes just on some of the human factors. I've already gone uh, over some of these, but. Um, we need to recognize some of the institutional constraints that's already been brought up uh, of participating uh, stakeholders. Our state and federal agencies have autonomy over their decisions. Water districts and private weapons answer to their boards. We have to consider, you know, these our different stakeholder groups are not homogenous. They're, you know, they're not they're not the same. We need to get into the field and work directly with them. And then the funding issue. You know, state and federal agencies get the funding. I mean, these other guys are, are, are duck club owners. They're private. Uh, folks, and you need to provide incentives uh, for them. And then we need to work with the regulators too, because uh, if this legislation, if the, these regulations are not realistic, then we need to uh, change them to make them a little bit more realistic. Adaptive management, uh, essentially, a learning by doing is, is pretty important, and that's going to be a big component of what we do out in this uh, watershed. Uh, it's a 10 to 15, even though we spent 12 years on evolving the system, it's, we've probably got another 10 to 15 years to go before we have a fully functional system. Institutional assurances, you've got you to assure people that you're not going to be here to, today and gone tomorrow. You know? So if they're going to invest in, in monitoring, especially these large monitoring uh, networks and uh, use their own dollars, uh, they need to have some sort of uh, either financial assurance or other types of assurances. And um, it's easy, easy by statutory bodies to, uh, to to give these, but the way the budgets are working, you know, the state of California is sort of severely in the hole. So even monitoring programs that have been around for a long period of time are, are now in jeopardy. And so, in conclusion, um, it's a it's a very ambitious uh, system. We're talking about real-time data sharing in, on an entire sort of. Uh, million, uh, well, more than a, a million acre of, of watershed, uh, but the, our regulators have basically provided this challenge. I mean, go real time or submit to the typical TMDL approach, which we know is not going to work and is actually very inefficient in terms of salt export. Uh, we focused on the wetlands because it's it's a local stakeholder group, it's a microcosm of the bigger system, and it's more, much more manageable. Um, it's going to require integration of the data acquisition, data processing, and meaning also QA, uh, model forecasting using that information, and we've got to automate all this stuff. Uh, and the information uh, dissemination needs to be done uniformly over the, over the basin in order to provide decent uh, decision support. Um, you know, Microsoft wants to work with us, we'd love you know, to use uh, some of the you know, sensor capabilities uh, that you guys have. Sensors are still sort of too expensive, at least the ones that we're using. We need to really bring down the cost of, of some of these things and make the information a whole lot uh, easier. And as I mentioned, the clock's ticking. You know, 2014 is when we've got to make uh, appreciable progress on this. Otherwise, you know, the hammer of the federal government comes down and we'll you know, we're, we're, we're the TMDL. Thanks for your attention. We have time for questions. Just a question. Are you collaborating with any of the agricultural, like say a precision agriculture software firm on some of the mapping uh, regarding salinity, but other, like other technology, there's so much out there, nitrogen, there's steel. A lot, see, there's a lot, and that's one of the problems. There's a lot of things going out there. A lot of local water districts will have their own irrigation uh, consultants, and they may do that. I mean, I, I had a, a couple of, uh, had a, million dollar uh, research program where we actually did some of the first salinity maps of the wetlands because these guys had no ideas. Whoops. I mean, they'd see these, uh, 
there are stands of these moist soil plants in some areas of these fields, you know, these fairly large, sort of couple of hundred acre fields. We always had poor stands and they wondered why, well, we mapped their soils and we figured, you know, it's, it's because they're too saline, so, you know, we help them sort of re-engineer the flow path through some of these things. So there's a lot of information out there, a reluctance, uh, you've got a lot of, you know, a very diverse set of stakeholders. We've got ir irrigation districts that are side by side that really are somewhat loath, you know, because their boards have, have farmers and maybe the farmer from one district doesn't like his next door neighbor who's with a different district. We've got a lot of these things to overcome, but, you know, I mean, the hammer's coming down. By 2014, you guys have got to sort of figure it out. So we're doing quite a bit just trying to figure out, you know, what are the... I mean, what are the, the groups that sort of make sense uh, to sort of work together? But we need these guys to make the decision. We can't come in and basically say, well, it makes sense for you to work with, you know, this district, work with that district. They have to develop their own sort of stakeholder groups, but we're trying to, trying to get that moving. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, there is a lot of data out there that could be very useful. Um, and, uh, you know, University Extension Service uh, does, you know, does some of it. But it's just getting it, you know, um, in, in a form that it can be used for decision support. I mean, that's, that's the hard thing. So in addition to the celerity, do you, uh, do you also measure any other water quality? Uh, yeah, celerity is what's been regulated. But um, for, for the wetlands, for instance, and actually, that's a very good point. I mean, actually, one thing we were wanting to do, and, and al although, you know, one of the local water district um, uh, you know, managers, uh, you know, ended up just using our sort of raw stage data. Um, we wanted to try to, yeah, add sensors on there that these guys, you know, would like. So webcam or something, you know, showing how many ducks, you know, sort of flown in that, that day. But actually, there's, there's a great anecdote. I mean, there's, there's one guy, uh, I'm a hydrologist by an irrigation engineer, actually, by background. So, but there's one, one guy that I've worked with about 20 years ago. And this guy was the biggest Luddite he didn't want to see a computer, he didn't basically want to use anything but his weir stick. With his wife's Ethernet system, we now have this guy, his wife loves it because she sees her husband, well, I'm not sure if he wants necessarily to be home more, but, but, um, but he, now this guy who was a complete uh, sort of technophobe, you know, it now logs on to the, the system to see just what's happening at all the gauges. He's, you know, he's going to have to visit, and everything, everything's fine, he doesn't have to make that, that trip. It's also replaced, he would go to these sites and take one measurement for the day. And these are highly variable systems. Now we're measuring this information every 15 minutes. So we have a, we can do water balances now. We could never do water balances in, in, the, in the past. So yeah, putting sensors out there that these guys might like is actually very low cost, you know, compared to you know, the cost of managing this whole system. So if they're interested in pH or they're interested in, in uh, you know, something else, yeah, sure, just stuff another sensor on there. It's all, most of the stuff is 4020 or SDI 12 compatible now. It's, it's a thousand dollar cost at that. Unless Microsoft wants to use, you know, <laughs> well, that's a really nice <laughs> cheap ones. Yeah, we'll use those too. Pardon the perhaps naive question, but would you mind commenting on how you go about determining and then adjusting as you go through the learning by doing uh, the, the quality assurance measures for the data? Um, well, do you get agreement on that or do you get disagreement? Well, we actually get much better agreement now than we did uh, uh, previously. So uh, there are, each one of the sites is, all, is quite unique. And because we're in a wetland environment, we're not dealing with uh, rectangular channels and uh, we're dealing with the highly irregular channels. And we're also dealing with beavers, you know, they like chewing on our cords and, uh, you know, just a lot of, you know, we're dealing with the environment out there and, and sort of algae blooms and, and, and those sorts of things. So our data is improving because our experience with each one of the sites is sort of improving and the countermeasures. Uh, I wasn't, I was more concerned about how do you, um, how do you decide what's acceptable level oh, quality? What's an ex oh, I see. Okay. Because as you learn by doing, you, you might no, change that's, the that's boundaries. That's right. Well, we've just set that at about 5% for, for, you know, for water quality. And that's the USGS pretty much you know, has their own. Uh, and, and for the USGS, 5% uh, is, 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 is usually a pretty good criterion. So 
if we go into the field and our sensor is off by more than 5%, then we actually go ahead and do the, the correction in the field. If, if it's within 5%, then we'll do that afterwards as part of our sort of QA uh, techniques. 5% um, is a little ambitious for some of the flow measurement, but for water quality, I mean, that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, one of the problems with, with flow QA, of course, is actually getting good flow measurement because um, to QA against, you know, so because we've got a lot of pipe flow um, and, you know, we've, as I said, got beavers that like building dams and all sorts of things. So, yeah, the flow, getting good flow information is, is, is really tough. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe that would be more like 10%. Okay, uh, I think I'll everyone wants to eat. Uh, so thank you. Thank you.